Well, hey, it's uh, Rob Daywall again. I've got another short lecture here for you. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of the case of Marbury versus Madison. Now, I know that a lot of you out there are working on a number of different cases that you think are like important and you know that's good but I think all of them kind of pale in comparison to the one of the first ones uh, that really had an impact on our society as a whole so basically what, what we're talking about is uh, this is a case that came uh, early on in John Marshall's uh, period of uh, leadership on the United States Supreme Court. It's very interesting that John Marshall was a cousin of Thomas Jefferson who was the president at this time. And this case kind of touched on uh, some things involving his cousin Thomas Jefferson and also the prior president which was John Adams. And uh, just before leaving office, they have these midnight appointments where he's coming down to uh, crunch time. And so he appointed uh, uh, a number of people as what we would call justices of the peace. Uh, we might modernly call them more like magistrate judges that would uh, assist the federal judges. And so I think what he was trying to do was reward this William uh, Marbury for his efforts uh, in the election and so forth, but uh, didn't pan out. And almost immediately, Thomas Jefferson, when he became president, he canceled these appointments. And so uh, what ended up happening is that Marbury sued an official at that time of the government who was Secretary of State James Madison, and he was trying to assert his right to be a uh, federal uh, magistrate, what we would call magistrate today. So um, one of the things that came out of this is that uh, although uh, John Marshall uh, kind of helped his cousin in a way, but he did it kind of through the back door, the more important thing was he asserted uh, the power of the Supreme Court that there is a balance of power, that there is the power to review the acts of Congress that were signed by the legislature. Now, over centuries, there have been a number of criticisms of the decision in this case. Uh, there's an Eakin versus Robb, which is a, you know, it's kind of a uh, dicta in that case that goes into um, how the judge in that case disagrees with the outcome of this case. Uh, there's also uh, a number of people, even today, uh, modernly, Tea Party people especially, that say that this was undermining of the true balance of power, which they claim was to be just the um, uh, Congress and the President, that the court had no role in this balance of power. And it wasn't a three-way thing, it was just two ways. So anyway, uh, what they claim is that by doing this, they've actually developed the power to make laws and destroy laws. Uh, and the, the, one of the decisions that they really point to is Roe versus Wade. But prior to that, the case of uh, Dred Scott versus Sanford, uh, prior to the Civil War, was a you know, monumental uh, miscarriage of justice by the US Supreme Court. So it cuts both ways. Um, you know, anti-slavery people were, uh, you know, aghast at the decision in uh, uh, Dred Scott versus Sanford. Uh, of course, anti-abortion people are uh, the same way, just think that this Roe versus Wade is terrible. But a lot of this springs out of the underpinnings of this uh, Marbury versus Madison, that it is assertion of power by the Supreme Court not just to interpret the law, but actually strike down laws that they consider to be unconstitutional. And so this has been an ongoing thing. It's considered to be 
uh, a standard uh, today. We just assume that the Supreme Court has this power, but there are many people that claim, no, they never had the power. Uh, they shouldn't have been able to assert themselves the way they did in this Marbury versus Madison. So as a result, uh, it's really kind of funny, but even though he kind of helped his cousin Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson was uh, very upset by this and tried to uh, denounce Marbury versus Madison, tried to get it set aside, uh, but he could not get the votes in Congress. So it was very interesting uh, that he got the result he wanted. He didn't want uh, this uh, uh, individual to get that appointment that John Adams, his predecessor, gave him, but he didn't want him to get it the way, or they didn't want to stop him the way that John Marshall stopped him. Because really what John Marshall did was kill two birds with one stone. Uh, he kept these political appointments as kind of like smarmy, you know, that you hear a guy pounds enough signs for you so you give him a job. Uh, in the 11th hour like that. Uh, well, but the other thing he accomplished was he asserted some new powers for the United States Supreme Court. Another important thing to consider in the legacy of the United States Supreme Court is up until that time, uh, John Jay, for example, they thought that the court was so trivial and had such a little role to play in the government of the United States that he was the Chief Justice and yet he gave it up to become the ambassador uh, of France uh, because it was just too boring. So John uh, Marshall actually had to create a job for himself in a way because there wasn't really a well-interpreted understanding of what the U.S. Supreme Court was supposed to do. And as a result, the power of the Supreme Court grew immensely and John Marshall stayed on for many years uh, because as it came out, it was an equal power member, a uh, power broker in the three branches of government. So based upon this, it was a very compelling case, probably one of the most important cases of all time. So I wanted you to at least consider that when you're thinking of uh, cases that you might want to uh, brief for um, your first assignment. Now, final word on that first assignment, and it is that I don't expect everybody to get this right. Now some of you have been working in my class before, you know what my expectations are, uh, it's going to be cake for you. But you know, um, even though it's in an online setting, you should work with some of your uh, fellow students uh, through the emails and different things. Share your work, try to show them the way so that we can all get through this um, unscathed. If you have trouble, you turn something into me, it's not good, I tell you it's not good, I will kick it back to you, but you, that doesn't mean you're done, that doesn't mean you're out. I want you to work on this till you get it right. We, what we're trying to do here is learn. We're not worried so much about the points. Uh, even though I'll make sure you get a fair amount of points, don't worry about that. Worry more about learning. Let's focus on learning in this class, okay? So as you're briefing, try to you know hone your skills, uh, become better at briefing. Uh, and you meet me uh, halfway and I'll meet you halfway and I think we'll get along great. So I uh, hope you enjoy this online class. I think it's going to be a little different experience than what you're used to. At least I hope so. I think it should be good. Uh, let me know if you have any problems or questions. I put my private email up here, robertdaywalt at me.com. Thanks for watching. I'll be in touch with something new soon.